Yo, dead ass. Dead ass. Can't y'all just picture, like, that sweet 16 ruler? <laughs> Yo, like, Frank was gonna really run up on people with that fucking sweet 16. Like, pop, 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 bitch. I'm fabulous. <laughs> she was fucking crazy. How's it going guys, it's Lynx973, so welcome, welcome, this is going to be episode 4, alright, you're going to still hear the squeakiness of the damn chair, I'm so sorry about that, I can't do anything about that, but I'm going to shut up anyways, damn, episode 4, this shit is fucking hilarious, I fucking, I love this episode, this episode was so fucking good, and, and this episode is just so good on many different levels, for different reasons too, so let's, let's just get right into this review and reaction, uh, series i'm basically just gonna break the episodes down um bit by bit and talk about different sections and pretty much the, my thoughts on it and then just basically kind of analyzing a little bit like how the characters felt and everything else the beginning the first scene of this episode all right yeah kind of it, it lets you know right off the bat you're gonna see like some deep shit like, you're gonna see some fucking psychological shit here and i really particularly like um Lewis's uh, overall arc within this episode, but let's get I'll get into that a little bit later Let's talk about the first portion right? the, the, the right afterwards the sweet motherfucking 16 <laughs> Returning character Turk. Oh, I miss Turk. Turk is fucking hilarious. I love Turk. Y'all if you do not like Turk It's just it's so good. He's just so good of a character. I'm, I'm really glad they actually bought him in this I mean you knew he had to make an appearance. He was fuck there they were season, season one and two, all right? He was on freaking, on everything. I see Jessica Jones. He was on freaking Luke Cage. He was also on Defenders itself. He was also on freaking Iron Fist. He, he was on pretty much everything. So you know who's going to make an appearance. But yeah, that was fucking hilarious. And I like the way that it still stayed true to uh, Punisher's Cold, and which is why Turk didn't die. Because he said it flat out himself while he was, you know, basically holding his head and almost pissing his pants. saying <laughs> While he was believing. And faith. <laughs> you say, yo, all I do is supply and demand. What people do with the guns, it's that's not on me. That's a completely on them. All I do is just supply and demand. Which is why <laughs> which is why Frank was just like it is brave. You can just see his reaction like fuck he's right. Alright, let me just knock him the fuck out. <laughs> uh, which I'm so glad he didn't kill so he didn't kill. You know what? Hold up. Yeah, you know, I thought that might help with the squeaking things. It didn't help. I'm so sorry. I gotta get a new damn chair, you know. Regardless, though, this shit was fucking hilarious, man. And then the, the just just the, the conversation between him and Michael when he got back and he got pissed off. He's like, you really want to take Orange out with this fucking pink Ruger? He's about to be a fucking Power Ranger or some shit. <laughs> I don't know, man. It just looks so bad. And then you can see some more of, you know, Michael and Punisher. And you can see the, the, the relationship that's kind of building there. You know, a little bit of a friendship. I mean, of course, Frank's going to always be a dick, especially with the dog store. But then you get to see more of Punisher's code, which is basically how he didn't want to buy the guns off the street because they would put money in the place of the wrong hands. So I kind of like that. that they keep going with it. And then you got some more of the dynamic of the leverage itself. And see, this is the part that I don't like about Frank, though. Like, he, he don't give a fuck, like... He literally has Michael's wife, like, on the phone. And then he has the balls to go in her house and just start fixing shit. Like, and you could tell that like, he got used to Michael because he kind of let, almost let it slip, like, kind of like he knows him throughout the conversation that he was having with Sarah. But, bro, hold up, hold up. Hold up. All right. One thing. Not gonna lie. Michael's kid, he's a fucking dick. <laughs> the one section. Or I, I, I gotta say, Frank's kind of towing the line a little bit, man. Like, oh, it's kind of fucked up because basically, like, he literally says the line, well, uh, you don't got to call a guy no more, right? And then you see Michael's eyes go like, bitch, what? <laughs> oh, shit. He was like, oh, hell no. Like, this motherfucker did not just do that. <laughs> and then that look. Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. You saw, you saw that look. I mean, just look at that look, like biting the lips and shit. Like she was about to eat him up. Like it was like no. And then Mike was just watching this whole thing happen. And it's just like no. Why would you do that? It's like that song. 
oh, there was a song that there's a guy that says like basically like you know why didn't you see me? Why did you kiss her or whatever? Oh my god, I was like. Damn, man. I grew up from bad for you. Like, if, if anything, if I was my girl, I would have fucking got my damn gun, ran up in there like, bitch, who the fuck you trying to fuck, man? <laughs> oh, man. Not not, not towards Sarah, towards, towards Frank. And then probably I would get shot. But whatever. Point is, yeah, that happened. <laughs> Let's move on to, uh, past that segment. Let's go to Diani. So Diani's segment in this fucking episode is actually pretty fucking cool. I like it. You know, um, at the first couple scenes, the first scene, basically, you got her so involved and so focused on trying to find out who his wolf killer is and so this is a bullshit and then you start hearing where sam starts talking about the actual um the main plot of this episode which is the the gun heist basically the guns that uh, turk was gonna buy basically the homeland just like ran up in there and just said no we're buying the whole fucking lot give me the damn guns so when i saw that i was like Okay, I kind of figured, like, it, it tied the two together. It tied what Turk said compared to what Homeland's going to do. And then you see Diani basically just not giving a fuck. Then, what's his name? Uh, Rafi, a.k.a. Director Hernandez. Hernandez comes in and basically just sets her straight, like, do you not know what the fuck's going on here? Like, you could be the head of this damn place, and you, you're worried about a little, you know, one or two injustices. Like, don't, don't focus on the bigger picture. And, you know, Diani, it looks like she took it to heart because when Sam was explaining the actual operation itself she was like all right listen you know good try all right you know good try but i'm gonna improve your shit all right you you fucked up here you fucked up here you fucked up there how i'm gonna fix this let's let's fix this shit right now that's basically how it how it went down but uh overall based on what happens afterwards i'll I'll discuss a little bit more like why i like her character the change in her character but it seems like she took that 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 uh advice that rafi gave to her straight to heart because you could see the change in tone like, like basically her kind of accepting it you know accepting the job that she has and her role which i thought was i thought was pretty cool you know and that line of black belt and, and carrot and stick kind of like a little uh a little jab just saying you know what this guy's a fucking dick but he's right <laughs> so i thought was, i thought it was pretty cool but anyways moving on to the next segment that i want to talk about which is kind of a long one which is basically lewis's character arc within this episode itself episode starts out you know shit's gonna hit the fan real soon because literally it starts off with him digging a hole and you're wondering like why the fuck's he like what's he doing did he kill his dad by mistake like is he planning on killing himself because you you know from the previous episodes we know that lewis is not all there man he's not he's not good like he has too many flashbacks i can't sleep and all sort of stuff so maybe he felt so guilty that he was gonna kill himself but no you see, he basically builds himself a foxhole. Like he he built up a fucking little basin right in his house in his backyard. Slept there, no problem. Like it's just insane. Like that that kind of mentality that he had. That he only feels comfortable when he is in a state of you know danger of war, and it helped him sleep through the night and everything. And then you have the little conversation when Kurt finally came and saw him because. You know, Lewis's dad just was like, yo, Kurt, I don't know what the fuck's going on with my kid, man, but he digging holes? Get your ass over here. Because, <laughs> like, you know, if I, if I was, that was, that was my kid, I would immediately, yo, Kurt, get your ass over here, please. Like, motherfucker tried to shoot me, now he's digging holes, I think he's going to murder me? Nah, I'm just playing. But in reality, it's just like, it, it kind of goes to show, like, how deep, how fucked up someone can can become because of just that lifestyle that they lived and you know the, the effects of the war that they had on him i mean just in that conversation you know when curtis was telling him how he messed up the hole because of rain and how lewis didn't think about that he started talking about his grandfather and then he moved the dog tags that were on his neck and just the sound kind of zoned him out entirely he completely faded from that conversation and he literally just heard a sound and that sound is just like a trigger and, and it took him away from the conversation I, I don't know if he was having any memories of what was happening in the past or if it just zoned him out but basically he missed that entire conversation and it goes to show little things like this are what actually happened to shoot, to real life veterans or people that suffer from PTSD and, and it, I really think it's such a it's such a good way of of showing how his mind is working right now, where his mentality is at. You know, he's having these nightmares, he's having these constant dreams, he's going through a lot of shit, you know, and, you know, he thinks he's not afraid, he's strong, he's got this, 
when in reality, he's really fucked. Like, he's really fucked. Like, he needs a lot of help. You know, and unfortunately, you can only help those that really want help. In his mind, he's not there yet. He's not to the point that he's doing bad. What he believes is what help is making him, like, put himself in a situation where he can go back to being in that, which is how he ends up going to Anvil. Now, Anvil, Anvil sticks out particularly because of a line that Curtis said to him where he says, you know, or when Lewis primarily says, you know, oh, at least you got that over there. And when, you, when he's talking about Kurt's leg, and Kurt's leg was basically, <laughs> Kurt basically said, like, what do you mean I got that over there? I fucking lost it over there, man. You got a fucking, you got my leg in some building and shit like that? And it's it kind of shows mentality. Like, when Kurt said, you know, you look in the mirror, you still see a soldier. And on these streets, that soldier's invisible to everybody. That's a feeling that can resonate with all the soldiers that, are, that have came back from war and that are still trying to get over that reality, still trying to get over... You know, the fact that they're not in danger no more. They can try to reinstate themselves into society. And it's just not easy for people because you don't know how people react and how people get affected by certain things, you know. You know, one soldier can go three or four tours and then come, whatever, two to three tours or something like that and then come back and they're like, like nothing ever happened. But then you have other people that go to one tour and they're fucked for life. Like, they're just mentally, they couldn't handle it. Or, or just in general, they something happened there that just messed up their brain, you know? It's just, it, it it's all depends on situations. You know, when you're in a war zone, you're not, you don't pick and choose. Like, okay, every, every single day is going to be the same thing. No, one day may be perfectly fine. You know, you may be tensed up because you're worried, but... Things are perfectly fine. Another day, an IED might blow up and fucking murder your best friend. You know, and that's the harsh reality of war. So it affects people in different ways. And in this way, you see uh, Lewis, he was living and breathing for that because that's all that's all his mentality was built up into. And you see it when he goes back into, into the section with Anvil. And Anvil is a whole different section right there. But I definitely want to talk about that, that starting, uh, the introduction of Anvil, basically. When you first see how uh, Billy kind of talks to the soldiers and you know he talks about the investments that the soldiers uh, were placed into so basically how the country made an investment on the soldiers how they were um, you know the, the cost of it 50,000 for this if you're a corpsman add another 200,000 if you're uh, you know a sergeant add 100,000 all these different costs that they were saying that the actual uh, that the actual government made on them and then he flipped it around and said you know and you made investments too you know you, you basically gave up your life you know your everything your freedoms and everything to go and be a part of this war and then this is the part that I didn't like you know when he talks about investments of it that he, he kind of toes the line between a con man and a person that's trying to actually want to help and the reason why I say con man is because you're playing with people's emotions at that point how do I say this? Speech is a very powerful thing. When you talk, when you say words, how you say them, the way you say them, plus your body language, can have such a profound effect on people in general. The power of speech is something that, you know, words can, can move cities, nations to act towards a certain cause and it can break people down and break down nations just as quickly so when you see you know Billy play on these emotions of these soldiers that that they feel like they were left out you know that you know they, they want to be validated it kind of toes that line between him being a comment versus a person that really wants to help I mean he first says it like what you're not worth the investment but in that line in particular, it's meant to elicit like, anger, emotions of anger in people, like saying, like, what do you mean? Like, you know, like, I am worth the investment. Or maybe to validate the feelings that they think that they're not. And that's how he can, you know, see the people that can actually make it in this program and cannot. You know, and then the line, which I can't, that, that really pissed me off. He said that, you know, that we didn't, we join the war because it, it's what, how did he say? It? He said, "We join the war. It's because we didn't want our lives to be gray. We wanted our lives to mean something." So not only like at the beginning, he 
you know, toes that line, makes them feel angry, valid or validates their feelings, and then gives them a purpose. You know, shows them that there is still purpose to your life, even though you may not have it. You know, and, and that's that combination of the way his his speech went basically was to say, listen, I know what you're going through. I'm going to show you how I can fix it. But the main thing I look at is, is it really good for them or for his pockets? And that's the thing I couldn't, like, that's what was making me, like, kind of think, like, I don't really think Billy's a good guy. Like, I'm starting to think, like, he really isn't. But there is a moment here that solidifies him as being a good guy. So, shortly afterwards, you know, then you start you start seeing how Lewis was basically a great leader. He's you know he was motivated to do uh, to to work hard. It's like he w- he was destined to be a part of that that group, aka a part of that brotherhood, that feeling of belonging that you know Billy was selling to all of them because that's what it was. It was it was just a sale. He was selling them that idea and how Billy how uh, Lewis was thinking. Like, yes, I need to be here. This is what I was waiting for my entire life. I can't believe it. I finally found something I can belong to. Even when the other guy couldn't finish doing the pull-ups, he was there like a great leader. Like, say, let's do them together. Let's do this. So you can see the instant change that that this experience had for for Lewis. You know? And then you see the conversation between Curtis and Billy. And when Kurt was telling him, basically, you know, this... He's not somebody that I would want watching my six. He's somebody that he's going to snap and he's going to cost lives. That's basically what he told him. You know, like he's going to cost lives. He's going to snap. It's not going to be good. See, now the power was in Billy's court. So basically, Billy could say, all right, am I going to still say fuck it because I think he would be a good soldier and do this? Even though it might be damaged to him in the long run, but he will still be a good, you know, field operator. Or do I cut him loose and then worry about what he's going to do? Or just cut him loose because I just don't want to be liable for, for like, what he he's what he might do over there. You know, he might be good, but I don't want to be liable for his shit. You know, and then he has a conversation with Lewis and basically he says it's just not going to work. You know, and at that moment, again... Billy could have easily taken the easy road and say, you know what? I don't give a fuck what Kurt says. This guy's going to make me money. He's going to do good admissions. I don't give a shit if it destroys his life. He's going to make my pockets deeper. But he took the other way out. When it's just... Still doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't 100% make him a good guy. But it definitely at least shows that he gives a damn. He's not fully you know, enthralled with, with the money portion. He actually still has humanity left. Which I liked. I liked that they did that because at the real beginning, it was just, to me, it was the sales pitch of a con man. That's what it was. And you see this this share of humanity that he had that he basically said, listen, if it's work you need, I got you. You know, I can find you something to do here. But you being a part of the Astro group itself, just ain't going to work. And then you can see how it snapped. Like You could tell Lewis was so despaired. He was just... Grabbing at straws, trying to say, "Please don't do this." You know, don't, don't do this. And how that was like another knife, right through his back, saying, "You're just another con man, or you're just another liar and com- uh, a liar in command, or some shit like that." Therefore, validating that feeling that he had that basically the government, his country, turned their back on him. So it's going to be very interesting to see how we're going to see Lewis's story progress going forward. You know, this is definitely a storyline that's meant more for Billy and Kurt. So it does keep, it, it's not really part of what Punisher sees. Um, but, I mean, it will be interesting how to see how they would tie the whole dynamic together. I, I don't know. Kind of makes me worried for for a character like, uh, you know, like Lewis, what exactly is going to happen? What possibilities can happen? Like, is this the people that were, uh, the, the writers kind of showing us how someone's path can go that far bad because at the beginning of the series when you look at Lewis he was just confused he was just stressed out but you see his decline his steady decline in his character all the way down to a point now he feels like he hit rock bottom 
and mentally he's not all there. So I, I'm really, really curious to see how the how his character is gonna play out. I think it's gonna be great regardless. Um, but it is worrisome. It is definitely worrisome, especially how some people will f relate to him. You know, uh, so we will see. But then the final section of this actual episode itself, gotta talk about the fucking heist. Now I'm not gonna spoil the whole car scene. All I gotta say is just don't be like Joe. <laughs> Yeah, that shit was fucking hilarious. All right, anyways, and and Michael's reaction is just fucking yeah, man. Although I will say this, though, I do feel bad for the guy that pissed himself. Yeah, I feel bad for him. That's all I'm gonna say. Just just watch it. It's fucking great. <laughs> and then you see that that wonderful line that um that Frank uses to, and basically taunting him, saying, "Oh, what you're gonna call some guy? Huh? You're gonna call some guy? <laughs> Who are you gonna call?" And then you see Michael be like. All right, you motherfucker. <laughs> Let's go. Let's do this shit. You got so pissed off. It was just fucking great. It was just overall just the bad between them. You could tell like they're feeding off of each other. It's fucking. It's fucking hilarious. And then the way they actually did the heist itself. God damn. And I like. And I like Diani. Diani's character. You see some more badassery in her. You see her take charge. You see her like you know realize what's going on. And oh my god. All I know is. I feel loved. I feel. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna touch you with singing. But that shit was fucking hilarious. And then you got the fucking chase scene. The chase scene, I honestly thought was fucking was done really well. It wasn't like a flashy chase scene that you're gonna see like mm, they're like jumping through fucking hoops and you see cars flying through the air and shit. No, it was a realistic chase scene. The motherfucker was trying to lose Diani and the, he managed. You know, Frank managed to lose Diani and then Diani managed just to, you know, kind of catch up and. You have the epic game of chicken, which unfortunately ended with the winner being micro. Because, <laughs> yeah, oh, man. I mean, you got to see the badass in her. Like, she did not back down at all. You saw she was determined. She was just pissed that the operation went south. And she was just determined, like, I'm not losing this shit, bitch. Like, we, I'm going to go down to the very end. And then I will come out on top, which... Fortunately, she did it because she kind of got ran over. I mean, technically, she's on top because Frank was kind of carrying her. But whatever. Point is that, yeah. Point is that, regardless, it just, Micro just, it's, why Micro? Really? Like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> and anyways, out, I mean, out of nowhere. Like, out of, granted, you could kind of tell that was going to actually happen because you, you did see, like, um, like some scenes where Micro was there, like making sure everything was clear, and then you could see he was conflicted throughout the entire time that they showed him. Uh, so you kind of could tell that something was gonna happen. I just did not expect, you know, like explosions and shit. But it's fucking. It was a really good. It was really good in general. Um, and then you have the conversation between Frank and Diani at the very end, where he basically says, "Yeah, I killed that motherfucker. All right? He was dirty. I killed him. Stay out of my way." Which I thought was just awesome, like you know, and, and Yanni again being a badass. She was, she even though she was like obviously down for the count, no way how she could survive it. She still tried to go for the damn gun. I like that subtle things like that. I like that because she was just still thinking mindset. I need to catch this guy. I need to stop him. And then the explosion happened. I guess that's when she finally realized it. Like she kind of like got out of that trance that she was in. And she woke up and she realized, like, holy shit, I really just almost died. You know? And I think she might have also noticed, too, that, hey, he did save me. I don't know. All I gotta say is... Motherfucking flamethrower! <laughs> yeah, I can't believe he actually had that flamethrower. That shit was fucking great. Anyways, alright, I'm done. Guys, if you like this episode, slap that like button in the face. Like, it was freaking Frank slapping Micro with his wife's... Uh, everything i don't know I, I just don't know how to, i was gonna try to make a joke there it just, just fell flat on the face just, just hit the like button for me just feel pity just, just hit like thank you <laughs> anyways all right guys i'm gonna shut up now I, I still have not seen episode five which i'm going to plan on you doing tonight no it's already 12 in the morning and i gotta wake up early as fuck doing it tomorrow reviews coming i'm gonna record the review tomorrow hopefully you guys will see it the following morning if not one day late Anyways, I'm out. Deuces.
shit. That was great.